Greetings and welcome to the North American Invasive Species Management Association webinar. I am delighted to have you with us today for our last webinar of the National Invasive Species Awareness Week, NISA 2022. Uh, my name is Trisha Bethke. I am the chair of the subcommittee for NISA 2022, and I am delighted to be here with you. Before we begin, allow me a quick moment to share a little bit about NASMA. NASMA is the North American Invasive Species Management Association, for those of you that don't know us well. Our mission is to support and promote and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. A little bit about what we do at NASMA. We are the stewards of international standards, including the mapping data standards and the certified weed-free product standards for forage, gravel, and mulch. This is National Invasive Species Awareness Week. NISA is the international campaign intended to raise awareness about invasive species, the threat that they pose, and what we can do to prevent their spread. Thank you for being here today and participating. Play Clean Go is our public facing education and outreach awareness campaign to empower recreationalists to stop the spread of invasive species. Get more information at the playcleango.org website and save the date for the Play Clean Go Awareness Week happening the first week of June. Professional development is a cornerstone of what we do at NASMA. We offer monthly webinars the third Wednesday of each month and special training events such as the EDSMAP Summit on March 23rd. We also have a new online asynchronous learning library, Invasive U, with a brand new short course for and professional certificate. And finally, save the date for the North American Invasive Species Management Association 30th Annual Conference. We will be meeting in the beautiful Sanibel Harbor Marriott in Fort Myers, Florida from November 10th or 7th to the 10th. So please uh, join us. We hope to see you there. This is the last webinar of the 2020 NISA series. The recordings of all virtual events will be posted on NASMA's YouTube channel within a week, and you can view your presentation from there. Oh, there's the save the date. All right, so please do us a favor, get involved. We are so appreciative of everybody's support. You can download your resource toolkit and promote NISA. You can invite your friends to participate uh, you can like us on Facebook at Invasive Species Week, and you can sign up for alerts to stay informed. Here are ways that you can get involved and join us. We have a great uh, we have a great website. It is chock full of super resources. So please take a moment and go over to. Uh, after the presentation, go on over to our website and check out all of our resources. I'd like to give a special thank you to our NISA 2022 sponsors. Again, our mission is to support, promote, and empower invasive species prevention and management in North America. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our final webinar on firewood rules, certifications, and recommendations across the United States of America. I'd like to welcome Lee Greenwood. Lee is the Forest Health Program Director for the North American region for the Nature Conservancy. And with that, Lee, I'd like to, I'm gonna stop sharing and ask you to get your slides ready. And I just wanted to do a quick reminder, if you have any questions during the webinar for Lee, please do us a favor and put your questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Tricia, for a great introduction. I hope you can all hear me, Tricia. Thumbs up, hear me good? Okay. And it's great to be here. TGIF, everybody. This is the last in an amazing series of educational webinars, and I'm really hoping to um, bring us home with a strong performance here. So I'm going to try my best to limit myself to finish up at 45 minutes after, so we have a lot of questions. And there's a tremendous amount of ground to cover between here 
in there. But what we're going to be talking about is the firewood rules, certifications, and recommendations found across the United States. And I'm going to be uh, talking about a specific report we wrote that was only published on Monday in tandem with National Invasive Species Awareness Week that is a professional education tool that allows for policy and outreach comparisons across all of those firewood relevant topics above. This webinar was prepared to launch that report as part of the Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative for both Emerald Ashbor University and National Invasive Species Awareness Week. The report's name is the Firewood Comparison Report, which is the short name. The longer name is the State and Territory Firewood Relevant Regulations, Certifications, and Outreach Statuses across the United States of America. And what it is, is not a report card, but rather a report of comparison between different tactics, between different statuses, and between different pest situations and regulatory situations so that you can see what are other states or areas doing? What are they not doing? What can you learn from those things? Or what choices could you make in the future if you want to propose changes to where you are at or make improvements? I asked Tricia to put the link in the chat, and I believe she did. So if you want to download the report directly, uh, which I highly encourage you to do, please visit that link when you're ready. So before we begin with the main body of my webinar, I'd like to review a little bit of vocabulary to make sure we're all on the same page. Quarantines is a term that a lot of people have become a lot more familiar with in the last two years, but used in the forest pest context, there are two different basic types of quarantines that either keep things in or keep things out. External quarantines are things that prevent threats, such as forest pests, from entering an area. Now, external quarantine says that California holds to prevent the entrance of spotted lanternfly is not represented on this map. However, anywhere on this map that has an infestation might be subject to that exterior quarantine by the state of California. An internal or an interior quarantine is the opposite. It strives to keep materials in a confined area to allow for better management, eradication when feasible, et cetera, the protection of resources outside of the infested region. Now, some of the internal quarantines for spotted lanternfly are represented by those red boundaries, and those are held by the particular states that those little red boundaries are in. So these are two totally different directions of tools, but they are the same basic tool, which is some sort of a law or rule or order or regulation that pertains to the movement of potentially contaminated items. Now, potentially contaminated items actually has a term. So we're going to start with that. It is called a regulated item. So it is something that could potentially move a forest pest in this context. Now, a regulated item, such as firewood, cannot cross a quarantine boundary without some appropriate reduction of its risk, such as a treatment, an inspection, or certification. In this presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about firewood as a regulated item because that's the topic of the webinar, but I just want you all to note that for none of the forest pests that we're talking about is firewood the only regulated item. So for instance, with hitchhiker pests such as the spotted lanternfly and the spongy moth, firewood is a regulated item. Outdoor goods that are kept in exposed areas such as potentially a movable doghouse would be a regulated item. Something like a Houseplant, if it was stored outdoors, might be a regulated item. Those last two, dog houses and um, houseplants, are absolutely not firewood, but they're important anyway. We're going to focus on firewood today. Now, I just dropped a new name because it was approved on Wednesday. Lymantria dispar, which is a common invasive species in the eastern United States and a very uncommon invasive species rarely found in the western United States, formerly was known as gypsy moth, but we're not going to use that term because it's widely acknowledged to be an ethnic slur, and it was removed from approval back this summer, and the new name Spongy Moth is now the approved name. I might screw up and accidentally use the old name because I've been using it for over 30 years, but I'm going to do my best, and one of the fun things about the new name Spongy Moth is that it's great for puns, so I'm going to try to clean up some terminology, and I hope we all absorb the new name today. So, Regulations that apply to firewood can be wrangled into several broad categories so that you can better understand them. There's spatially drawn regulations. Those are geopolitical based or pest infestation boundary based, such as a state or an island or a country. 
Then you also have distance from origin regulations. So the source of the pest to where it might be going. New York is a leader in the distance from origin based regulations. They have a 50 mile rule for firewood. Then there's pest driven regulations, which is something that says simply if the pest is present, materials cannot be moved in or out depending on the circumstances. So those aren't spatially drawn, but rather driven by the presence or absence of a pest. So these are the three different rough conceptual types of regulations that pertain to firewood. And what's very important to know is that regulations that pertain to firewood do not have to actually be about firewood. So the pest driven regulations are not about firewood. Firewood is just one of many things that can move the pest. So let's start off with our first data visualization. This is firewood relevant statewide external rules and regulations according to the different types, roughly as I laid them out before, but not precisely, and we'll get into that. So the states that currently regulate the entry of all species into their state that might be moved by out-of-state firewood is seven states. They are re represented by the brick red color. So starting with Maine, heading all the way down to Florida. The states that have similar but not exactly identical regulations that regulate some but not every single type of firewood and species of firewood are the ones that are sort of sunshine yellow. So most out-of-state firewood, but not precisely all out-of-state firewood. And that's Connecticut, Utah, and Oregon. So put together, that gives you 10 states that have a pretty strong exterior quarantine on firewood. And then we also have four states that in the course of writing the report in the last four to five months of research, our communications with the state plant regulatory officials or other people involved in this project uh, as Sources of information have let us know that they are planning or proposing to put in place their own external firewood quarantine. So put together, that makes for another four states. That's 14 states that in the roughly near future will have pretty strong external quarantines on firewood. Now, there are 27 additional states that hold an external pest-based quarantine, such as prohibiting the movement of any material that might be contaminated with emerald ash borer. That's pest-based, not firewood-based. And those states are the most common category of firewood-relevant rel statewide external rules or regulations. And those are sort of a butter yellow color. Two of those states are currently looking at dropping their last remaining pest-related firewood quarantine. That's Indiana and Missouri. So those numbers will go down a little bit in the future once they do, in fact, rescind those two pest-based quarantines. And then 13 states have no state-based exterior regulation proposed nor found. Those are the states that are in gray. We have been struggling, just to be completely frank, with getting all of the relevant information for the American territories, American Samoa, Puerto Rico, et cetera. And so that information may change once we reach a better conclusion as to what they do or do not have. So that number might be a little bit different in the future. Oh, only reminder, please put questions in the Q&A or the chat. I'm going to take them at the end so that I can just keep moving in a timely fashion. As I mentioned before, regulations can be wrangled into several broad categories. We were just looking at state-based external regulations, but for pest-driven regulations, you've got a lot of different types of pests of concern that are not federally regulated, as well as, and I will talk about this, pests that are federally regulated. Pests of concern that are not federally regulated are often subject to, or firewood from areas in, with pests that are not federally regulated are often subject to very limited, very specific regulations. So for instance, mountain pine beetle is native to the Western United States pine forests in some states, and Minnesota has an exterior quarantine prohibiting the movement of firewood from those areas into Minnesota or, and other regulated items as well. Rapid Ohia death kills the native Ohia tree found on Hawaiian islands, and there is an inter-island quarantine to prevent the movement of that pathogen because it's not found on every island, and so there is still some opportunity to mitigate that threat. Spotted lanternfly has various state regulations, but not an overarching federal regulation. And some pests, even though they are highly damaging, do not have any regulations that we were able to find that pertain to them directly, such as laurel wilt found in the southeastern United States, 
and the various complex of shotful borers found in Southern California. There's at least three species of them that are very similar. So when we try to look at what happens inside a given state, things get messy really fast. And so we tried to break them out into categories, but the categories all overlap. So there isn't an easy way for us to create that same nice data visualization and map that we created for the exterior regulations, because each of those exterior regulations is held by a state. This is totally different. So let's look at all the different intrastate regulations that may pertain to firewood. Distance-based regulations are very clear cut held by one state, like I mentioned, New York has a distance-based regulation. And then there's two other states that have a relevant distance-based situation. Illinois has proposed a distance-based regulation. It is not yet enacted and we will have to look to the future to see how that goes. And then Maine has a proof of source regulation, which is very similar to a distance-based regulation. So it's sort of a gray area there. Then you have states that regulate the movement of state firewood into state lands and parks. Nine have a pretty clear cut regulation or policy limiting the movement of out of state or um, otherwise potentially contaminated materials into their state lands or parks. And then Virginia has sort of a unique legal framework that allows a state park to put in place one of those rules as an option. So that would be a 10th, again, a little bit of a gray area there. And then there's 22 states that specifically have pest specific state health quarantines where interest intrastate, so within the state, movement to firewood is regulated, and 22 states have that. That's different from our prior map, which was the movement of materials into the state. This is movement of materials within the state. So for instance, we're going to go back to the spotted lantern fly map because the complexity here is really helpful. If we look at the state of Pennsylvania, and I'm not trying to pick on spotted lantern fly, I just want to be clear, it's simply a really good case study for regulation. If we look at a state like Pennsylvania, you are not permitted to move regulated items without treatment certification or other appropriate measure from the blue counties that are surrounded by red lines into the green counties in Pennsylvania. And that is to reduce the spread of spotted lanternfly within Pennsylvania. So that is an intrastate state held firewood relevant regulation. Then we have states that are either fully or partially under a federal quarantine. And let me take you through this abbreviation soup here. Asian longhorn beetle is present with a federal quarantine in four states right now. Imported fire ant, also known as red imported fire ant, is present in 14 states. Moving firewood that has been stored in direct contact with raw soil where imported fire ant breeds and lives in colonies could easily be considered and has been considered in the past in limited circumstances as a regulated item and therefore not legal to do and potentially risking moving imported fire ant to new places. That also applies in Puerto Rico. Spongy moth is either fully or partially under federal quarantine in 20 states. Most of those states are completely under quarantine, which means you can move items freely intrastate in that area, but you cannot move items clear out of the federal quarantine. But some of the states are partially under federal quarantine, which means from the infested area of the state to the uninfested area of the state, you may not move anything that may have spongy moth egg cases or pupae on it, or adults, of course, but that's not as likely. Giant African snail, otherwise known as giant African land snail, um, currently only has one state and three territories under federal quarantine because, and everybody like do thumbs up for this one, the giant African snail infestation in Florida has been officially eradicated. So the remaining areas are Hawaii and the three territories. If there was absolutely no interior firewood regulation that pertained in the least or a pest-based quarantine, we titled, we totaled that up and we found that that was 12 states and territories. So there are 12 states and territories that have no restrictions that pertain to firewood whatsoever on the intrastate movement of materials. But those 12 states and territories may have restrictions on the interstate movement of materials, depending on the circumstances. So here's an example of a federally regulated pest, sudden oak death, also known as Phytophthora remorum. Can, you cannot move regulated items out of parts of northwestern California and a single county in southwestern Oregon because regulated items departing there pose a risk to the trees and shrubs of any other place where Phytophthora remorum might thrive. And you don't want a pest that has a very wide host range 
Likewise, the situation with imported fire ants is an interesting example because firewood does not jump to mind immediately as a regulated item. However, the soil quarantine that applies has definitely been put into play occasionally with firewood that was, like I said, stored in direct contact with soil. So if you live anywhere in the bright pink federal imported fire ant quarantine, it is definitely in your best interest to use excellent hygiene with your firewood, store it indoors, don't move it illegally and so forth, because you would not want to potentially be found to be in violation of that federal quarantine. And again, moving materials in between states may or may not, within a federal quarantine, may or may not be legal depending on the situation. But generally speaking, the outer borders of these quarantines are regulatory, have the regulatory framework that's more important than within them. So how do we move firewood if you do have either an external quarantine or an internal quarantine or an intrastate regulation, any of these things. In the case of firewood, right now, the major tool is a state-based firewood heat treatment certification program. Generally speaking, these are held by state departments of agriculture, but that's not universal. And what it means is that the state department of agriculture has either a process in place or an ability upon request to certify a heat treatment facility such as a kiln to bring firewood up to a safe temperature for a safe duration of time to basically bake the life out of anything in that firewood. And that renders the firewood very low risk. There is no such thing as no risk, of course, but these heat treatment certification levels that are in the PPQ treatment manual are pretty high and they're pretty good. And if you actually adhere to the heat treatment appropriately as written, the firewood should be very safe. We have 26 states that currently either have a program in place and are using it to certify firewood so that you can tell that it's pretty darn safe to move. Or when our research, my research analyst, Laurel, who couldn't make the webinar today, but did the bulk of this work. So let me just say, thank you very much, Laurel. When she reached out to them, she did find that they have the ability upon request. So just because you do not have a firewood producer, currently requesting that they have their firewood certified as heat treated in their kiln doesn't mean you couldn't do it if you were asked. So those two qualifications of states get the dark green, and you can see that is one state over half of the United States. And then also there's three additional states that are building that process into place right now. So they're developing or proposing the process and they're hoping to get it moving soon. Whether or not they get it done in this fiscal year or this calendar year remains to be seen. There's many different variations in how quickly things can progress, but they're trying to get it done right now. It's also worth noting that this map has shifted a great deal with the deregulation of emerald ash borer. It used to be that the legal authorities afforded by the prior federal quarantine on emerald ash borer allowed for federal systems in place to certify kilns as allowing for heat treatment. Without the of the federal quarantine on emerald ash borer, which was lifted about a year ago, the legal capability changed. And now federal entities cannot use that particular authority in order to certify kilns. Now state entities in some cases can, but in other cases um, they do not have the statutory authority or they do not have the staff time or other barriers may exist. In other cases, some states have simply said, we don't believe this is really within our framework and we do not intend to stand up a program. So in those two cases, either no ability or no current intent, uh, those locations are listed in the map as light green. So no ability or no intent is 19 states at this time. That may change. Things are definitely moving at a decent clip on the issue of heat treatment certification. It's definitely something that can be viewed under the lens of economic development to allow firewood producers to participate in a regional scope of moving their firewood across state lines in highly regulated parts of the United States. This facilitates that movement. And so whether or not this map stays static is a really interesting and unknown look into the future. I will also note again, we have been struggling a little bit to figure out the precise status of some of our territories. And so those are listed as gray. That doesn't mean they couldn't certify materials. That means we have not yet firmly established their status. And we will be 
reissuing this report in approximately two and a half weeks with state-based appendices, and I'll get to that in a minute, but also at that time we are really hoping to have firmly established the status in every single territory so that they have equal footing in the report as all of the states. One thing that was very interesting that came up over the course of the research and discussion portion of building this report was that we actually found that seven state plant regulatory officials that we were interacting with regards to state-based firewood heat treatment certification questions said, it would actually be really interesting if we had a third party certification option for this. And that was a spontaneous conversation. It was not something that we were mentioning. It's not something that's currently in place, but it's clearly a thing that people are thinking about and talking about. And it was so striking that we had that many people mention it that I thought it was really important for us to talk about it. At this time, there is no third party certification option for the heat treatment to firewood. However, there's clearly some interest and there is third party certification of other forestry products such as timber and lumber. And so it would be interesting to pursue that as a conceptual possibility. Last but not least, I run the Don't Move Firewood Outreach Campaign. It is a campaign that extends across the U.S. and we also participate in Canada. And one of the big things that we do is we try to make sure that outreach is consistent and visual, excuse me, and visible. And when you think about visibility, there's a couple different things that come into play. One is whether or not the outreach itself exists. Is it out there? Are people talking about firewood movement? But then the other one is, is it in a place where people might look just because I, as an outreach professional, think that the public should look on a state agency website for firewood communications doesn't mean they will. They may only look at a state park campground reservation email. They may not look on a state agency site. So in order to assess the consistency and the visibility of firewood-based outreach, what we did was we assessed all the places we could imagine from the state perspective that firewood outreach should be visible in. It doesn't mean that we were judging the quality of the outreach. Basically just, do we think the public will find it? So we looked in four basic locations, state agency firewood communications. And in some cases, those states had, any given state might've had two or three even agencies that applied here. So for instance, you might have um, state forestry agency and a state department of agriculture agency that both had firewood communications. That's great. But if we found one good location on a state agency, we checked that box. Then totally separate from forestry or agriculture, we looked at specifically cooperative extension. The cooperative extension obviously is usually associated with a university and that is a separate location from the state agencies. Next up, we looked at state parks or sometimes that's called state lands. For state parks and state lands, we looked at camping related communication locations that are held by the state agency that owns the parks or lands. Then we also looked at their third party reservation processes, or sometimes it's the same website for reservation processes. But as you go through the process of making a reservation, you encounter many more locations within. And in the course of those reservation processes, we decided we would do a quasi random sample. It's definitely more of a, what's the word from my college statistics? Is a striated sample? Anyway, it wasn't truly random. We basically just picked one uh, campground in the north or west, one in the rough center of the state, and then one in the south or east, depending on the geography. So it was roughly represent, representative. So let me show you the results of this. We found that some in state agencies, so either agriculture or forestry or Department of Natural Resources was pretty pervasive. So we had really good visibility of those. Very few had low visibility. So there was the presence of some education, but it was extremely difficult to find. And then only, I believe, two had no visibility whatsoever. For cooperative extension, the nature of the graph was completely different. We had just a few places that had or excuse me, we had 10 locations that had really high visibility firewood information, 30 that had been mediocre. It was hidden in a pest report or an alert or a press release from 10 years ago. 
and then 10 had absolutely nothing we could find. For state parks, totally different distribution of data that we found. So for state parks, the majority did have high visibility, a couple had low visibility, difficult to find information, and then a somewhat disappointing number had no information at all. State parks is where a lot of the public really would encounter fire regulations. They are looking for things like, what are the quiet hours of the campground? Can you bring your dog? And that's where a firewood regulation should live because it's just basic information about a campground. And if that information was missing, unfortunately, you're missing a outreach visibility option that could be really powerful. With an even greater number missing with state parks reservation processes. So once you start making that reservation, do you encounter the rules of the campground and do those rules incorporate firewood movement regulation? That, that measure was even a little bit lower, unfortunately. So looking forward, this webinar will be recorded. It will be available soon, according to the abilities of the North American Invasive Species Management Association, getting these things all posted. The report itself, which Tricia was good enough to put into the chat, and actually, Tricia, if you could paste it again for anybody who's like, oh, now I really need to read it, is completed from the national perspective, but we will be putting the individual state and territorial appendices, plus all the revisions from our webinars, if we find any errors, in the next couple of weeks. So you can definitely download the full report right now, um, but just know that it will, in fact, be a little bit improved in a few weeks once we do a little bit of last minute fact checking, as well as adding all the state and territorial appendixes. Now, I just wanna make really clear for anybody who's familiar with Dome of Firewood's website, that our public state and Canadian provincial and territorial summaries will not and do not follow the formats seen in this report. This is a professional tool. The public state Territorial and provincial summaries are designed for a totally different audience. They are designed for basically the camping or firewood using, such as home heating, product audience. And so they contain very different information written up in very different ways. I would be delighted if you wanted to visit that information, but I just want to make very clear those are two separate tools. That information is available at don'tmovefirewood.org slash map. I think I actually ended a little earlier than I thought, which is fantastic for questions. Uh, I will be available for the next 25 minutes, it looks like. But first, I would just like to say thank you to all of our partners throughout North America and special thanks to USDA APHIS, who has been a very big supporter of the campaign as well as this report. They fund the Don't Move Firewood Outreach Campaign and the Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative, which is a professional group. Special thanks to my employee, Laurel Downs. She is fantastic, and she led the research and writing of the Firewood Comparison Report. So if anybody has been emailing with Laurel, I really appreciate that you've been working with her to make sure that this report is complete and factual. If you'd like to reach me, please find me at the email below. And Trisha, let's do questions. Absolutely, Lee. Thank you so much. That was great. And what a robust analysis, really. Everybody's been waiting for it. It was released. I think it's great. We do have a number of questions and it's good we have a little bit more time. Uh, thank you to our anonymous attendee who went to the Don't Move Firewood website and let us know what the law is for Colorado. So that's a good update. We have a question. Doesn't USDA still have restrictions Hold on. On spongy moth, Asian longhorn beetle, emerald lash borer. And then which state has the best firewood visibility and who needs the most work and does it align with regulations? That's a lot. We can work, walk through it. This is a great question. Okay. And actually, let me just open that Colorado. I think I can do it. Yeah. So if, if anybody wants to look at that Colorado question or statement, this is a really, really good clarification by anonymous attendee at 1016. It is absolutely against the law to move materials out of the interior quarantines mentioned here held by federally regulated pests. But Colorado doesn't hold those laws. Colorado does not have an exterior quarantine prohibiting them. 
That is the interior quarantines that are held by federal entities. That's an important difference. We did not analyze whether or not a federal quarantine exists because it either does or does not exist. We analyzed whether or not a state has its own freestanding external quarantine or internal quarantine. So it's a really important difference and this is absolutely accurate. And it relates to Robert Sullivan's question, which is why I wanted to be super clear here. Doesn't USDA still have restrictions on the movement of spongy moth, Asian longhorn beetle? Yes, although not emerald ash borer. Oh dear, let me find that again. Okay, so yes, absolutely. But again, those are interior quarantines. They keep the pests in. Then Robert Sullivan asks, which state has the best firewood visibility and who needs the most work and does it align with regulations? I wish I had actually told Robert to ask this question because it's so perfect. Thank you. All of that information is available on the report. There is a chart, if memory serves, it's roughly page 13 or 14, but you'll have to find it yourself. There are only four states that received a four green star rating for firewood visibility and Yesterday, I was chatting with somebody in South Carolina, and I do recall distinctly that South Carolina is one of those four states, and I congratulated that person. I cannot remember off the top of my head the other three states, and so I would urge you all to go look. On Great. that chart, we also talk about, we also have a little indicator of whether or not there's a regulation, and then you can look at the status of the state, and it does not always align, but you can visually see the difference. Thanks, Lee. Gary asks, what are the requirements for firewood imported from other countries? Outstanding question, Gary, and fantastic segue to the picture you are all looking at. That is firewood from a former Soviet bloc country. I think it's either from Latvia or Estonia. I just don't remember right off the top of my head. And actually, in very fine print, you can see what its heat treatment is. It was heat treated to 71.1 degrees Celsius for 75 minutes. It is not legal to bring firewood from other countries into the United States, excuse me, from overseas countries into the United States without a significant heat treatment component or other potential uh, treatment. Heat treatment is by far the most common. So when we import firewood from Europe, for instance, it has to be uh, heat treated to a pretty high standard. Firewood from Mexico and Canada has different restrictions and levels of treatment required from firewood from overseas, which is why I caught myself in the midst of that sentence. Gary also asked, why would states be rescinding their quarantines? This is a really great question. And it's a it's a multifactorial answer. There's lots of things going on with rescinding quarantines, but two take two states currently rescinding quarantines that are kind of highlighted on the map, which is not an intentional highlight so much as just factual, are rescinding thousand cankers of walnut disease quarantines. And that past is now much better understood by both managers and scientists than when it was originally emerging um, on the scene of forest pests. And a lot of the Eastern forested states have made a decision based on enforcement capabilities, many other factors to rescind those quarantines for various logistical reasons. And so as we're seeing those quarantines specifically being rescinded, what ends up happening is we're losing important tools to regulate firewood, which perhaps is um, problematic. But that really speaks to one of the things I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, which is that sometimes firewood is regulated from the pest-based perspective when in actuality it might be better to consider regulating it from the firewood perspective. Okay, great. Are you also going to produce a report about hay weed free hay movement regulations? That's a great question. That is not inside of my professional sphere. However, this report certainly could be a model of how to do so. And I would be thrilled to coordinate with anybody who was interested in that. I work on forest pests and hay and weed-free hay would be terrestrial weeds and microorganisms. Great. 
and following up on the weeds, do noxious weeds with windborne seeds become embedded in tree bark and spread via firewood? That's a really interesting question. I do know that the incidental fines of seeds in international trade can be a problem. So for instance, a highly textured product like a tree could potentially have incidental fines of windborne noxious weed seeds. So this is not a completely out of the blue type of concept. I have not seen that in the firewood specific literature for North America. Good. I think you have a question. We had a uh, late joiner and she was at, they were asking, have you talked about the cert certification of firewood? And yes. they're talking, they're thinking about asking for FIDOs or some compliance, compliance agreement for shipping to Hawaii. Can you want to comment on that? Yes. This is an interesting issue, which is how do you determine that firewood being moved interstate is actually safe. You can say it's safe and be under compliance agreement, but how do you really measure that and how do you verify it? And there are quite a few states that have significant labeling components so that it's written right on the label for firewood. Where is the firewood from? What is the heat treatment that was applied to it? So it's easier to spot check things. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is consistency between systems. So if you have firewood coming from a state that has heat treatment certification, that system is consistent with the receiving state, what they're looking for, what they want, and what type of regulations will provide the safety that they're hoping for. So I guess to, to best address Helmut's question, what we could do let me see, I'm just gonna muck with some windows for a moment here, okay. We could look at what states currently offer heat treatment either as a standing program or as a process, that's those green states. So keep this map in your imagination for a moment. Now let's look at this one. What states require those heat treatments? There is not always complete consistency here. So both of these maps, for lack of a better term, have somewhat of a random assortment. We do see that the brick colored states tend to be on the eastern edge of the country, but we don't really have a consistent distribution. The ideal scenario would be that there was a lot more alignment here, that we would have a much better consistent approach between firewood relevant statewide external rules and regulations and states that offer heat treatment and certification, because then we would be able to rely on more than, as Helmut was just saying, just the label. We would be able to rely on a really consistent network of treatment that was verifiable between states as being the same everywhere and safe to move. David put in that there's an example of their program. We enter into a compliance agreement with those businesses, certify their kilns, and then audit records to ensure that the kiln is heating to the proper temperatures. Absolutely. That's great. So that's an example of a comprehensive approach start to finish. The state agency looks at the business, they certify the kilns are reaching the temperature and the duration necessary to properly address forest pests that might be in the firewood. And then they audit the records. So there's a verification over time to make sure that this is happening appropriately. That's a system that is, um, it's reliable. You have several steps in place to make sure that um, barring gross fraud, the system is going to work to reduce the spread of forest pests and firewood. That's the type of system that we would hope that all of these state-based certification programs would have in place and follow for the long term. It's the number one thing that we can do in order to limit the spread of invasive species. It's just don't move firewood. Just don't move it, keep it, treat it, do what you need to do, but not move firewood. I just, if anybody has any questions, I think there's another comment that's just popped up. Have you found 
people avoiding the firewood regulations by moving logs and other products and then later converting the product to firewood? This is such a great question too. So this is a really interesting reflection of a question I got in my prior webinar on the same topic back on Tuesday, which was, what is firewood? And I was posed that question in a really good way because to regulate something is to rely on a definition of it. And firewood can be defined in many ways. And Sometimes definitions of firewood rely somewhat on intent. Do you intend to burn it as fuel wood? In which case, for instance, people trying to avoid firewood regulations by later converting it to firewood would in fact be covered under a firewood definition like that. Or do you define it by the length of the cut piece of wood, which is a thing that sometimes I have seen in regulations. This dep the answer to this question of have you found people avoiding the firewood regulations <laughs> I don't work in a strictly regulatory capacity. I have not found this, but other state regulatory agencies could potentially have seen this. Certainly it is theoretically possible and human nature is to find loopholes and so it could happen. But what I will say is that the way that a state regulatory or a federal regulatory body defines firewood matters to minimize loopholes like this. And the definition of firewood is not static. It depends a lot on regional markets, on what you are seeing in your forestry industry or your local culture. Different parts of the United States have different sort of cultures around firewood. So it's a very tricky question. Uh, what is firewood? How do you define it? And how do you prevent things like this? People avoiding the firewood regulations by moving 10 foot wide pieces or 10 foot long pieces of tree instead of eight foot long pieces of tree. Faith asked, is there a way to compare the number of introduced pests with the presence or absence of regulations to show the value of the regulations? I wish that was the case because it would provide a really solid factual and scientific background for this work. However, we have not been able to do that. That doesn't mean it couldn't be done. It just means it hasn't yet. One thing I definitely would like to say is that, let me go back to my screen sharing. It's a little fidgety with the windows here. Okay, let's go back. There we go. This map, pretty clearly, if you are familiar with a related map by Sandy Liebhold, shows that the areas with the highest forest pest concentration by county in the contiguous United States correlate quite clearly with the highest prevalence of regulations. So New York, Vermont, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Maine, those states have some of the highest densities of forest pests of any state, and those are also quite regulated. So the reactionary human nature to see a problem and then pose a solution is very much in display in the sort of big overview of this map. Likewise, you see the larger blocks of gray states that have no regulation found and none proposed are in areas, for the most part, that have not had as hard hit a forest pest presence or problem historically, maybe not today. But in general. And with that in mind, that may be why they have not yet found the momentum to put in place an exterior quarantine. Now, again, that clarification we did get from the individual from Colorado that it is illegal to move materials out of the interior quarantines of the forest pests of the southeastern and eastern United States. That's absolutely true, but Colorado does not have a freestanding rule that says you can't move those materials in. So they are relying on someone else. And this map shows that you, you can rely on both someone else and yourself if you so choose. Great, you got a lot of really good comments in the chat box. Thank you very much. You've done a great job. I really appreciate that the staff of NASMA had gave me the opportunity to give this report. It's uh, been the culmination of a lot of work and 
these regulations and these policies matter to invasive species managers. They give you the tools to either do better outreach or do better enforcement or whatever it is that your professional um, responsibilities are. So I would like to just say thank you to Nesma for making sure that I had this venue to share this important report. And also, I'm just going to keep saying, download the report, review it, tell me what I got wrong. Tell us how we can improve it. We would love to know what needs to be clarified if there's something that isn't clear. So I see anonymous attendee just said, I'm curious as to when someone could avoid the firewood regs by transporting whole logs. Wouldn't the whole logs be regulated as well in most or all cases? I think most cases, is accurate. In most cases, there are rules and regulations for the movement of materials that are timber or lumber, large logs, logging industry products, but not always, to be frank. They are a completely different commodity and they do have a different risk profile. Whole logs going to a timber mill have a completely different life cycle analysis of risk than firewood that might sit at a campground for years, potentially on the ground in contact with the soil if it went unused. So yes, absolutely. You could in theory have a firewood regulation that should apply to logs, but does not, but they are very different commodities. They have very different constituencies and stakeholder groups. They have very different endpoints and they represent different risks. Lee, in a perfect world, what would you hope for after you're doing this analysis? For me, I look at that map and I know what I want on a regional basis. I want uniformity, but. Yeah, I want a couple things. I think great, what is often called harmonization, which is basically gentle uniformity. <laughs> An acceptance that perfect uniformity is not going to happen but at least coordination and harmonization. I would like to see better and more extensive coordination and harmonization of regulation on this map. I think, for instance, the fact that Illinois and Michigan are putting in very similar regulations to uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, I think that's great. And I encourage other states in that region by having Across state similarities, the public is less confused, the regional firewood distributors are less confused, everybody has a more even playing field. But then also, I would say, I would like to see more states offer, even if they do not need to actually provide, I would like them to offer heat treatment certification. And if that's not going to be feasible because of the particular legal political, financial, whatever feasibility in your state, and I accept that that is true for some states, I really think it's interesting and worth pursuing this idea of third-party firewood certification. It is a very interesting solution, potentially, to a very tricky problem. Last but not least, I want to see all green bars. Every one of these is completely doable we could definitely have a basic best practices recommendation every single place in this chart. It wouldn't be something that has significant roadblocks. It's just best practices. You could just recommend good actions. It doesn't have to be a regulation. One. Quick question, are pallets and other dunnage regulated as firewood? To the best of my knowledge, they are only regulated as firewood when the firewood regulation you are looking at has an intent aspect to it. So some firewood regulations have a wood product with intent to burn sort of language in it. And things that are pretty much not firewood, like a pallet, pallet is not firewood, it's pallet. If it's pretty much not firewood, but you fully intend to bring it to a campground to burn it, then if the regulation says, if you intend, it counts, then that's covered. But typically, no, 
typically without an intent to use as fuel would part of the regulation as a gross generalization, that would fall under a different type of regulated item, which may or may not be pertaining to a given pest. Great. But I was just gonna say it's very inconsistent because the world is a very big place and people burn all sorts of stuff for firewood. I'm gonna give a shout out to Lee and her website. I think it is absolutely phenomenal. She was great to work with last year as we were updating the Illinois track cards. We needed some new resources for a special campaign that we were doing for our campsites. Certainly over the last month, or not last month, last year, year and a half, we've seen a big, huge uptick in attendance in campgrounds. And we wanna make sure that those people really truly know to buy it locally, burn it locally, don't move firewood. Really trying to encourage helping out the local vendor in that area because they really are truly reliant on the business as well. Please made some great suggestions about having language on the registration at for state facilities, state parks, state camps. I think it's a great opportunity for us to reach out to our local partners and get that language if it's not already there out there so that we can be very specific. We'd also like to focus on regionalization, to be honest with you. It's so easy to drive from Illinois to Iowa, Illinois to Wisconsin, Wisconsin to Illinois. If we had some harmonization in regulations, it would be very beneficial. With that, I, we're right at 12 o'clock. I want to encourage everybody. Thank you very much, Lee. This was a great wrap-up. Thank you. Great way to end a fantastic week of education and resource sharing during MESA. I encourage everybody to mark your calendars for November 7th through the 10th. Come down, join us in Fort Myers, Florida for the annual conference. If you are at all interested, please submit an abstract. Go out to nasma.org. And you can also go to NASMA and look at the events that we have upcoming. So again, thank you all very much. And thank you, Lee, for a very important and very useful report. It really is very helpful, very valuable. Thank you. And remember, if you're going to NASMA this fall, you're not allowed to bring firewood in. They have a full <laughs> external quarantine. So shout out to Florida. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you, Lee. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.